Good evening. Ten years ago, 14 women were shot dead at a university in Montreal, sending shockwaves through the nation. Nothing had prepared any of us for something like this. Marc Lépine's hate crime left behind a profound and painful human tragedy. But he left other things, too. There was the list he'd prepared of other women, many of them well-known in Quebec, whom he had also planned to kill. My name was on that list. There was the mystery, as there always is in cases of sudden mass murder, about what in Le Pin's life had led him to pick up a gun and attack complete strangers. And there were the other human lives, ended and damaged, the ones most Canadians have never heard about, but who, beyond any doubt, were also victims of Marc Le Pin. Tonight on the Fifth Estate, a special full edition report on a legacy of pain. A silent gathering in a park in Montreal. Women's names emblazoned on the lawn. These people have waited 10 years for this, a lasting tribute to what they've lost and never want forgotten. On December 6, 1989, Nadine and Sylvie Aviernik lost their sister Maude. Just two days before, Nadine had a haunting dream about it. Maude uh, was sitting just beside me and all of a sudden she, she flew up in the air and, and I was just seeing her face turning around and coming towards me and she, she told me three times, uh, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die and uh, I woke up. Jean-François Larrivé, who everyone calls Jeff, lost his wife. They'd been married only three months. Jeff looks to heaven now to keep their union alive. I prayed every night. I pray for, for the past 10 years. And basically what I do is I ask the Lord to receive her in his uh, kingdom of, of heaven. I would be happy if I could receive a telegram from God saying, Jeff, please, please stop praying for this. This is done. A single mother of two Thérèse Martin lost her eldest daughter, Mimi, a good student and a gentle soul. Tout le monde l'adorait. Mimi, pour moi, c'était c'était pas juste ma fille, c'était aussi euh, mon amie, ma confidente. C'est euh, j'ai élevé mes deux filles toutes seules. Puis on aurait dit que il s'est développé avec eux autres quelque chose de vraiment extraordinaire. Suzanne Edward lost her only daughter, Anne Marie who, like all the women killed that day, had life by the tail. An accomplished athlete, linguist, and musician. We used to play music together, and uh, I used to play the piano. She played the piano very well as well, but she played the guitar. I was a happy woman. I'm no longer a happy woman. I cannot possibly be a happy woman after this. This, the slaying of 14 women at L'Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal, an event so loathsome, so unimaginable. It's taken 10 years to be able to come to terms with its sheer brutality. It was about 4 p.m. when Marc Lépine, wearing jeans and military-style boots and carrying an assault rifle in a plastic garbage bag, headed for the engineering school, a place he'd visited many times before. It was the last day of classes before midterm exams, and the school was quieter than usual. In class 311, students were giving oral presentations. Adrien Chernéa was one of two teachers present. A team of three students just finished presenting their project. After having spent close to an hour in the registrar's office, just waiting, Lipin told a clerk, he started on his gruesome pilgrimage. Suddenly, a very strange man came in. He had a shotgun with his hand on the trigger. He was uh, two meters in front of me. He 
didn't appear to us to be a madman. He ordered to the man, to the students and to the professors, to go on the right side of the class and the girls on the left side. Before shooting, Lipin shouted, I hate feminists. All nine women in the class were struck down, six dead, three wounded. A university campus was suddenly transformed into a war zone. There were emergency vehicles, urgence santé, police cruisers, I believe. I mean, there were all sorts of lights, there was all sorts of action. Lynn Moore of the Montreal Gazette was one of scores of reporters on the scene. There were people in the stretchers. It wasn't clear if they were injured or if they were dead. Jeff Larivé was also there that night. He'd come to pick up his wife, an employee at the school, and soon was caught up in the nightmare. He's the man you see on the left, peering over the stretchers. Nobody was married and all the stretchers going out. I began to be more, uh, more scared, you know, so I was yelling her name like this to, to the window, Marie's, like, like the window were not open, but maybe she could hear me. And nobody was at the window. He was walking slowly, really calmly. The visage was completely massacred on the côté. Soon, news of a crazed gunman started trickling out, sending anxious families into shock. But no one knew anything for sure. All the, the night that I was listening to the news, uh, you, you keep hoping and hoping and hoping uh, the, something like that couldn't happen to, to, to my sister. Uh, it's impossible. So, uh, and you're still thinking that, no, it's impossible. But on the other hand, I was thinking about my dream and I was, uh, was very scared about it. Chaque fois que je voyais une fille, quand on regardait la télévision pour que je voyais une fille qui sortait sur une civière, je disais c'est Mimi, c'est Mimi. Elle disait non, maman, voyons, c'est pas Mimi. Je sais pas pourquoi, mais j'ai senti tout de suite qu'il qu qu avait arrivé quelque chose à Mimi. Ça, je l'ai senti. It was roughly 6 p.m. when the Montreal Police SWAT team entered the building. Police relations officer Pierre Leclerc, whose daughter was a student here, promised to go in and report back to the media. En fait, j'y ai pas pensé. Tu sais, je suis parti là à toute vitesse, moi, sachant très bien que Marie était à l'université. Bon, j'ai pas pensé moi, que Marie serait une des victimes. Jamais, jamais, jamais. Hankering to know more, Lynn Moore saw a plainclothes policeman going in and followed close behind. She'd be the only reporter to get in. As soon as we were in the building, he went one way, and I went another, sort of up the stairs. On the second floor, there was an open area, sort of a, a common area, a lounge. People sort of ghost-like walking around the edges of the lounge. Knowing something horrific and evil had happened, Moore went on, came to a classroom, and looked in. And in that classroom, on the floor, there were two bodies. One was male, and he had a rifle across his legs. The other was a young, blonde girl. And they were both lying there relatively close together in a pool of blood. The young girl was Marise Leclerc, daughter of police spokesman Pierre Leclerc. Là, je suis devant ma fille qui est décédée et le gars qui l'a sans doute tué, il est à côté d'elle, il s'est suicidé. Bon. Euh, tu sais, je... qu'est-ce qu'on fait avec ça? Je ne sais pas quoi faire avec ça. She was wearing a sweater. And it's funny about that sweater because that's what I focused on for some reason. I remember thinking, okay, um, that morning was, was it her mother, her father, her, her friend, her co lock that said, you know, really, you should wear that sweater, it's cold out. Ça m'a un peu surpris de la voir avec sa chandelle là parce qu'elle était venue le dimanche précédent souper à la maison avec son copain, Benoît, et elle le portait. 
Puis on lui a dit, Marise, tu sais, t'as bien un beau chandail, tu devrais... Ben, je l'ai acheté pour Noël. Alors, ça, tout de suite, en voyant ça, je me suis dit, tiens, regardons ça. Puis c'était elle, en plus de ça, tu sais, j'ai reconnu ma fille. Marise Leclerc had been shot, but only wounded. Hearing her cry for help, Lépine finished her off with his hunting knife, stabbing her repeatedly in the heart. He was then heard muttering, oh shit, before using the last bullet in his gun on himself. His favorite swear word was later found scribbled on a student paper, like a discarded shred of rage. Jeff Larrivé, himself a graduate of Polytechnique, had been standing outside for four hours when he noticed a former teacher come out of the building. So uh, I asked him, did you see Marise? Did, did, do you know something, you know? And he looked at me with that look that I cannot describe. And when I saw his look, then I knew that something bad, very bad happened. And he said nothing, just said nothing, basically. Tension in that building was incredible. Lynn Moore's journey into the heart of darkness was about to abruptly come to an end. She was on the phone to her editor when one of the school's security guards spotted her. I could just see him just get really tense and angry and he says, are you crazy? Don't you know they're killing women here tonight? Late that night, the bodies of the 14 women were all put in one room, though names of the victims were still to be released. Frantic relatives were now coming apart. Sylvia Viernik, the eldest in her family, was amongst them. All the family members were in the same room, and we knew that we were waiting for bad news. And 3.30, around that time, The door opened, the policewoman and uh, the policeman stand up and they said, there's only one name to say. To identify? To, okay, just one name to communicate. And I stood up and I said no. <laughs> and it was mold. So, and after that I forgot everything. My sœur était là, au moment donné, me disait à Thérèse, prends une grande respiration. Thérèse, respire. Ils ont dit, t'arrêtais de respirer, tu respirais même plus. C'était, pour moi, c'était impensable. Ça ne se pouvait pas que Mimi soit partie. C est, c est, pour moi, je ne pouvais pas l'admettre qu'elle qu qu était plus là. Bright young women like Mimi Richard, now reduced to a grisly notation in the morgue ledger. Mort violente, violent death. the horror of their own deaths etched on their faces like a broken promise. I didn't recognize my sister. Sylvia Viernik was shocked to see how all the victims had the same withered look. They look old. Uh, With the same impression. The same expression in, 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 in uh, their faces. Um, I, looking, looking, uh, looking my sisters, I knew that she, she's dying with pain. She's dying with uh, fear, and uh, she, she was alone. She's dying alone. So, and this hurt me a lot. Lipin's rampage had been meticulously thought out and cruelly executed, often telling the men to get out of the way to better shoot the women. But it wasn't supposed to include the finance department, where Jeff's wife worked. Fate would prove particularly cruel to 25-year-old Marise, who, hearing a gunman was loose, rushed to lock the door. But that, that door, that damn door, you know. You have to open the door and then take the handle from outside and, and twist it and check if it's locked, you know. And she kind of opened the door to check if the door was locked. At the moment that she opened the door, MacLippin took the handle trying to, to keep the door open and Maris with his two hands was trying to close the door on the other side and they fight like this for a certain time, I don't know, maybe a couple of seconds. Finally, Marie succeeded to close the door. So, uh, you know, basically she's safe right there, but there was a window on the side of the door, you know, these little windows with the little metallic wire inside. And he took his gun and he shot through the window. A couple of shots. 
and he and he killed her at the first shot. We enter the world and mind of Marc Lépine when we come back. If we would have told Marc, uh, Marc Lépine's story uh, a day before the massacre, everybody would have pitied him. But then he commits this massacre and the next day he's a monster to everyone. Nobody wants to hear the story. What he did was so terrible. But this was a, a, a youngster suffering. Suffering, deep suffering, and there's nothing we could do for him. The Fifth Estate will return. And now we return to the Fifth Estate. The Montreal Massacre has changed the lives of many people, as it haunts many more, mine included. From the time I found my name on Lipin's hit list, I have felt the need to get inside the man's head, find out what could have possibly motivated such hatred. So today, a former friend and roommate of Lipin's, Eric Cossette, and his twin sister Annick and I have come to the place where Lipin devised his bloody deed. Ten years ago, Eric and Lipin shared this apartment, now occupied by other young men. I remember his, uh, his desk, his computer, he liked so much computer, machine. Books, huh? Well, ah, yeah, true, a lot of everywhere. books everywhere. We read, read a lot. Yeah. What, what did he read? Everything. Literature, uh, science fiction, a lot. And he read poetry? Yeah, also. Also. Yeah. It's funny, this is open and then suddenly I remember looking at it and saying, you don't have many clothes. Huh? You have, what, two pair of pants? Yeah, it's true. Yeah. I remember that now, yeah. so vividly, and making fun of this. And he said, well, I don't need much. Uh, he didn't take pleasure in many of the things that uh, normal people would take pleasure in. Mark Turner was 14 and in high school when he met a gangly kid called Marc Lipin, a boy who was good in school and liked to joke. He definitely had a great mind. He was very knowledgeable on many subjects, uh, ranging from uh, history to technology. Um, he was fascinated by uh, many, many things. And he just loved to talk to you about a subject that he knew something about. The eldest of two children, Lipin was the son of Lies Garbi, an Algerian expatriate who dabbled in mutual funds and Monique Lipin, a nurse by profession who'd once been a nun, not the most typical of households, perhaps, but one who could put on a good show. Lies was a big show-off, you know, money-wise. Louise Lipin was married to Monique Lipin's brother, Bernard. If he would take you to a restaurant or something, you know, bring on the best, you know, Dom Perignon and what the heck. But in the Garbi Lipin household, it was not all wine and roses. Eric and Annick Cossette remember their friend Marc as being secretive and closed. If we would have told Marc, uh, Marc Lipin's story uh, a day before the massacre, everybody would have pitied him. But then he commits this massacre, and the next day he's a monster to everyone. Nobody wants to hear the story. What he did was so terrible. But this was a, a, a youngster suffering, suffering, deep suffering, and there's nothing we could do for him. He just had the impression that he was, I guess, a bit different, not as sociable as some people, and uh, I guess a bit closed. And you probably had the, the impression somewhere that he was hiding something, but I mean, if he had the capacity to, to kill 14 women, it, it's something that he kept very well hidden. One thing Marc Lipin kept well hidden was his real name, Gamil Garbi. At age 13, he abandoned his father's name in favor of his mother's. It was a clue to what was happening in his family. After eight years of marriage, Monique Lipin filed for divorce. She's refused to be interviewed, and no one has been able to locate Garbi. The only way to get an insight into their lives is through these legal documents, publicly available at the Montreal courthouse. They contain lengthy testimony from Monique Lipin, her sister Pierrette, as well as Lies Garbi. Uh, 
Whenever events this shocking occur, the question always is, how can this happen? In the case of Mark Lepin, the first clue to what motivated such unmitigated rage can be found in the 1976 divorce proceedings between Lepin's parents. The testimony contained here tells a harrowing story. Tonight, using the verbatim court transcripts, we recreate some of the testimony from the divorce hearing. He's a very cruel man who didn't seem able to control his emotions, who raised his hand to me and the kids for the least little thing. I never hit, pushed, whatever. You never hit your wife? I never hit my wife. You never hit your children? Never. He would hit my son full in the face, which would leave marks for sometimes for a week at a time. Judge Jean Lemay Warren presided over the case. It, it's terrible for a child of that age. He was already 12. He even had the, his nose bleeding at a certain point. And he fought, it was forbidden for the mother to go and, and take him and console, console, him, to, console to, him. To console him. So that's very, very cruel. Louise Lipin remembers the cruel treatment her nephew and niece were subjected to. His childhood was pretty bad. Him and his sister were locked up in their bedrooms with a little potty, a table and two chairs and their orange juice. I remember when I, when I saw the door locked and the potty and, and the chairs, and I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. Did you ask about that? I asked, yeah. I said, what for? I was told that because Lies wanted to have peace and quiet while he had his gentlemanly brunch, all dressed up, all stiffed up in his uh, white collar, and, uh, and he even had the old shirts with the, uh, I'm looking for the term. Cufflinks. With the cufflinks, yeah. He had the, old, the shirts with the cufflinks and all spruced up, you know, and until then he used to leave the house and then the kids would come out. But I remember them, the look on their faces sometimes if we'd be at a Christmas party or something. What was the look on their faces? They were scared, scared of, the, the, of their dad. From court testimony, it seems the whole Lipin family was afraid of Garbi. Monique Lipin's sister testified that even separated from his wife, Garbi managed to spread his terror. She recounted one family dinner. My sister was cooking the meal. He took the casserole and threw it outside, pot and all. My sister went out to get the casserole. He went out, grabbed her, hit her against the stone wall several times in front of the children. Dr. Jacques Talbot is a leading psychiatrist at the Institute for the Criminally Insane in Montreal. He's the man police called upon to assess Marc Lipin's mental health after the fact. Talbot says Lipin was a lot of things, but he wasn't crazy. Ce ne sont pas les gens qui ont des maladies psychiatriques. Le plus souvent, on retrouve des gens qui ont été blessés, qui ont été meurtris émotionnellement, physiquement, sexuellement, qui ont été exposés eux-mêmes à la violence et qui ont grandi euh, en ayant comme ça des déficits dans leur personnalité. As Lipin grew into adulthood, he became more and more reclusive. Few things excited him, except war movies and war games. His friend remembers an outing the pin organized in this adult playground. Just to see him getting into this type of game was sort of unusual for him to be so uh, openly happy about doing something to see him do some running and jumping and trying to kill as many people as he could with the, the paintballs was sort of eerie, uh, considering what he did later on. Okay, he's it, he's it, he's it! 
Elliot Layton is the author of Hunting Humans, one of the first studies on mass murderers. A leading Canadian anthropologist and observer of humans by profession, Layton says we shouldn't dismiss these crimes as merely random events. They tell us a lot about the society we live in. The fact that Nakhlepin singled out women, how significant is that? Well, they single, they single out from the dominant tensions and frustrations in a society and incorporate them into their own thinking. So sometimes it's racist, sometimes it's with Le Pen, it's sexist, but whatever the tensions prevalent in a society are, are at that time, they're likely to be reflected in the thinking of these kinds of killers. So this occurred at a time when women were finally breaking loose the shackles that had tied them for 10,000 years. Uh, it, it, it's not surprising that out of that tension in the general society would come some lone killer who blamed them for everything. Court documents show that in the Lipin household, Lies Garbi made sure that his wife would not break from her shackles, forcing her to abandon her career and work for him instead. I was a two-finger typist. In any case, he forced me to work at all hours, and every time I made a typo, he would hit me in the back of the head. Sometimes it made me dizzy. He let me know that a woman was not equal to a man, that a woman was a man's servant. The judge eventually granted Monique Lipin a divorce and the custody of the two children. It's not only being slapped in the face how many times, it doesn't matter. It's uh, the whole atmosphere of violence uh, and of non-respect, non-respect of the of a woman of his mother. The father's lessons were not lost on the son, who by the time he was 20, was also denigrating women. Posting things like this, a bad play on an anti-drinking and driving ad, women drivers are criminal. I think he probably did feel rejected from women, I guess, because he had never had any. Um, Perhaps his fear comes from the fact that women give you emotions, and he was not a, an emotional type of guy. Um, he, uh, I did talk to him about that. I mean, uh, I've asked him, like, how would you feel if, if your mother died and you went to the funeral? You wouldn't feel like expressing emotions. He says, oh, no. There was no way that he would show any emotion. He'd be uh, as hard as, uh, as stone. By all accounts, Lipin had a distant relationship with his mother, who, according to friends of the family, had her own difficulties expressing emotion. She was very exuberant at times and a lot of fun. And other times she'd be very in a closed shell and be very cold. What yes. was it like in his family? So it was very um, severe. Severe. Um, his mother didn't, didn't talk a lot in that in that time. She was like uh, very, um, you know, uh, it was austere, austere. Mm -hmm. An austere mother, an abusive father, a bitter and frustrated young man. A sad story, but not one that necessarily adds up to a mass killer. What makes Marc Lipin become Marc Lipin? Experts say that there will always be a part of mystery in all this. But there's also a certain arithmetic in what makes a mass murderer. It takes an obsessive, narcissistic personality that blames others. Lipin had that. It takes an abusive childhood. Lipin had that. It takes an accumulation of failures. He had that. In the fall of 1989, at the eve of his 25th birthday, Lipin had been rejected by the army, rejected by women, had no job, and was about to get his unemployment money cut off. Worse, he'd had a dream that he thought he'd been robbed of. Lipin had always wanted to study engineering here at Polytechnique. He'd even told his friends about it. But in the spring of 89, he was turned down. In Le Pin's mind, women had usurped his rightful place. There's a long 
a long series of events which begins with a depressed, vulnerable, confused person who feels he's failing in the social order, who begins to incubate this campaign but uh, vengeance and the fantasy of it, and then uh, there is one triggering incident that finally decides he's going to, he's going to do it. So see, I remember this balcony. Annick Cossette has never forgotten Marc Lipin standing on this balcony 10 years ago. It was September 89. Eric was leaving for South America for a year. She had never seen her brother's roommate so devastated before. The whole time watching us. And uh, he looked sad. He looked very sad. And uh, I, I was driving and, and looked around and he was still here and he followed us till the last second. That was it. And then I, I this week actually, I was, I was at home and then I said, oh my God. Maybe he knew, he probably knew that they wouldn't see one another again, that he would die. On December 6, 1989, the very day of the mass killings, Lipin wrote to Mark Turner, who'd also been a roommate for a time, advising him the phone was still in his name. No emotion, hard-nosed to the end. It just goes to show you that he really had planned everything and he had made sure that all his points were covered. Before Marc Lipin, it was rare for mass murderers to be so young. But this was one young man who seems to have been thinking vengeful thoughts for a long time. I think it was either me or our roommate asked him what he thought about suicide. And he said, uh, well, I don't want to take part in this discussion, only that uh, if I ever did commit suicide, I would take as many people as I, as I could with me. When we come back, how the killing continued long after Marc Lipin lay dead. And now we return to the Fifth Estate. that every year marks the anniversary of the Montreal Massacre, a solemn concert that helps us mourn, but perhaps still not enough. For this tragedy has created yet more tragedy in its wake, if at times less spectacular. The bodies of the 14 women were brought here to the Montreal morgue. They all had signs of multiple bullet wounds. Some had been shot as many as nine times. The spectacle of so many beautiful young women being senselessly murdered seems to have been too much for the mortician on duty here that night. After years of service, that man never worked at the morgue again. His departure was the first sign that Marc Lepin would make many other victims. Victims largely unknown, sometimes unlikely. The number of victims that uh, a tragedy like this makes is, is innumerable. It's ju it just snowballs. Suzanne Edwards' daughter, Anne-Marie, once had a good friend, Hélène Tinel. Also an engineering student, she was at the head of her class at the University of Toronto a talented girl with lots of ambition. She, she said to me a few weeks back that she died also on December 6, 1989 with Anne-Marie. The girl came apart and she has had depression over depression over depression and has never really recovered. And I asked her if she wanted to be part of this interview and I said, and then, you know, you know, tell your story. It's so important. It's an homage to the girls. And, uh, you know, and uh, she said, no, I can't. I can't, but you, you tell them. She said, you tell them. 
How difficult it is. How difficult it is is something Thérèse Martin knows well. Her husband walked out on her and their two daughters years ago. But before Mimi's death, there'd been good news. Her ex-husband, Michel Richard, had reconciled with their daughter. Mimi was about to be married and wanted her father to be there. But days later, she was killed. Je pense que c'est ça, c'est quelque part, c'est euh, peut-être un, un peu le remords de pas de pas avoir euh, eu un lien plus étroit avec elle. Que je pense que c'est c'est ça qui pesait sur lui. Oui, oui, oui. Already a troubled man, Michel Richard committed suicide almost exactly a year later, on December 14th. Troubled men could be counted by the dozens here at Polytechnique in the months that followed the killings. They were deeply upset, and uh, many of them told us that if we knew what was happening, we were able to go to uh, risking our lives and disarm this madman. So they did feel guilty? They fe felt guilty and they were uh, absolutely in a state of shock too. Sarto Blais, who was just about to graduate and get a job, was one of the students affected. He was not the same person. He was terribly shocked and uh, high depression and nobody was able to stop him crying. Nine months later, Sartre Blais hung himself in the bathroom of his apartment. He left no explanations. In Montreal, his suicide went virtually unnoticed. But a thousand miles away, the tragedy would ripple onto these shores. Sartre Blais came from Chandler, a small community in Gaspésie, where his parents still lived. Dr. Marc Leblanc knew Sarto's parents and saw their devastation. C'est un enfant unique qui représentait beaucoup d'espoir pour les parents. Il avait investi beaucoup d'amour et de d'ambition pour leur fils. Less than a year later, Gilles and Micheline Blais followed in their son's path, committing suicide together. Dr. Leblanc was the local coroner, in fact. His report says that the Blais were unable to carry on. He also blames the killings at Polytechnique for their son's fatal depression. Seven years after the massacre, in a dark and dejected corner of Montreal, there would be another death, in a part of town where emblems issue stark warnings to children. A young woman would squander her life in an apartment strewn with dirty clothes and used syringes. Ambulances were called to the scene. Sylvain Doré was on duty that night. C'était une jeune femme qui était, euh, je pourrais dire, là, euh, très abîmée euh, par la drogue, puisque c'était une, une personne qui prenait, qui consommait de la drogue depuis très longtemps. The young woman was Nadia Garbi, Marc Lépine's sister, dead from a drug overdose. His sister was quite different uh, than him in the sense that he was, I guess, sort of perceived as somebody who was very intellectual and socially outcast, whereas his sister was more with the in crowd. So obviously there was a big difference between the two. There's also a stark difference how the two troubled siblings dealt with the depths of their despair. Both died by their own hand. But on March 1st, 1996, Nadia Garbi, aged 28, died alone in a junkie's pad of cardiac arrest. This piece was written by Jeff Larrivé for The Woman He Lost, only three months and three weeks after they were married. It was the most beautiful day of my life, and I realized it even, even more after Marie's died. 
Ten years later, Jeff has surprising things to say about the man who took it all away from him. I didn't spend time aiding him and trying to kill him in my dream or make him pay for what he did. I didn't spend time doing that. What I believe, he was born well and alive and normal, and I believe that the external influence, uh, maybe friends, his father, things, uh, things happen in his life to make him very aggressive toward the people, especially towards women. Yeah, I hate him. I hate him in the beginning. Uh, which, uh, what right did he have to do uh, something like that, destroy uh, how many families? Um, Yes, I hate him, yeah, and I will never, 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 never going to be able to forgive, yeah. never. Maud Aviernik now has her name etched in steel and stone. But you know them with the last letters, and you have a letter of reference also, yeah. The park commemorating the 14 women will be called Place du 6 Décembre and will open officially next Sunday. Situated at the foot of the University of Montreal, it features only the names of the 14 women, cryptically inscribed, curved like silver wings. But that, that conscientious effort to have to decipher the, the names is, uh, is interesting. It, it, it creates a participation on the part of the viewer to figure it out. The inscriptions are designed to encourage people to decipher and remember these names. Remember the heedless violence that once wrenched innocence from a nation and visited such heartache on so many. Même mes parents sont pas aussi proches de moi que tu l'es de moi quand on parle de ça. Ah oui, bien c'est ça, c est, c est, c est, on les aime tellement, hein? C'est notre vie, c'est... Euh... C'est notre vie et c'est notre ouais, mort ouais. en même temps. Ouais, ouais, ouais.